Sure, uh, Bishop Darren A. Ferguson. I am the pastor of Mount Carmel Baptist Church in Far Rockaway, New York. My name is Dr. Yvonne M. Bennett. My role at the church, um, my husband and I pastor Hallelujah Christian Fellowship Ministries. My name is Q English. My title is Reverend. I pastor the Bronx Christian Fellowship Church along with my husband, Pastor Tim English. I'm Derek Harkins and I am the Senior Vice President for Innovations in Public Programming. My name is Kip Bernard Banks Sr. I serve as the Senior Pastor of the East Washington Heights Baptist Church located in Southeast Washington, D.C. Um, I'm Reverend Tony Lee, the um, Pastor of Community of Hope AME Church. My name is Reverend W. Anthony Sinkfield. I am the pastor of Payne Chapel AME Church in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm Christy Sinkfield, First Lady of Payne Chapel AME Church in Nashville, Tennessee, the wife of Pastor Sinkfield. When I first got to Mount Carmel, maybe eight years ago when I first became pastor, there was a young lady there who was about 16 and she was pregnant. And she came to church one Sunday and she said to me before service, she said, I really don't want to be here. And I said, why? She said, because I'm 16 and I'm pregnant and I want people looking at me funny. And that bothered me. It bothered me on so many levels. It bothered me on, on one level because I felt like if any conversation was supposed to be had with that young lady about pregnancy and about sex should have happened and it didn't happen. So that was a moot point. So now our job as the church is not to belittle her or, or embarrass her or ostracize her about her pregnancy. But our job is to help her bring forth a, a healthy baby. You sin in some houses of worship and the house of worship I grew up in a long time ago. If a girl got pregnant, she was excommunicated from the church and the man and the boy could stay there while they got other, other girls pregnant. And, and from there, some of those same children, they got pregnant again and or became drug addicted, rebellious. Why? Because they didn't never sense that we cared for them. And it's almost as if we were never young ourselves. We have, we've have we all experienced Premium some type of trauma. I know I have. Personal story for myself um, is that my mother, um, when she was young at a church, um, not super, I mean, she was in college, had an unplanned pregnancy by a gentleman who didn't want to step up and, and take responsibility. And she was in college at the time, had to leave the program in college, had to come back home. And the deaconesses of that church uh, came to her house and told her mother that she was going to have to come and stand in front of the church and apologize. Um, and God bless my grandmother who kicked them up out the house um, and, and then called the pastor. God blessed that pastor, Earl Harrison, who told my mother's mother, I tell Nancy, she has nothing to worry about and I'll deal with those deaconesses. It, you had a church in which you had some folks in the church that were so caught up um, in dealing with what sin or not sin and dealing with, you know, um, appropriateness. They were going, and they didn't say the father had to come, but Nancy had to come before the church and apologize to the church for letting them down. I was um, 18 when I got pregnant, and my husband and I, we got married. We were married at two months. I was two months pregnant because you didn't go home and tell my dad you were pregnant. You went home and told my dad you're getting married. So I was out of high school, and um, two months later, we got married. I was 18 and he was 20. But through the process of that and going through the consequences of that, I felt that I needed to be able to offer something to the young girls to tell them, don't do it. It worked for me. I'm married 52 years to the same man that I conceived the child from. We Some of the same things that we practice in the church at home, we do on steroids. Um, uh, challenging our daughter and our son, daring to dream. What is it that you want to be? Where do you want to go? What is it that you want to accomplish? And letting them articulate that. And, and then stepping back from the end of that dream and talking about the steps you need to take to get there. And what steps do you not need to take? What could be a hindrance to that? we don't have enough difficult dialogues about things like sex. And we don't have those dialogues with our children. 
we, we generally skirt around those things. We, we preach abstinence or we preach wait until you're married. And unless that's backed up by some data, by some, some inspiration, by some, having some real conversations with our young people, it, it really avails nothing. Uh, unfortunately for the church, sex, sex is a taboo topic. Uh, and it, it, it just goes with, with, with the tradition, certain things you don't discuss in church. Uh, however, it's everywhere in society. I mean, you, you know, the Christian church really has no option but to pay attention to teen and unplanned pregnancy. Um, it's happening right in our houses of worship. So if we don't pay attention to it, that means that we're saying, you know, that we're not doing our job. Uh, I, do, I believe that as a house of worship, we're called to be a church without walls, you know? It's not just about John 3, 16, which is at our core, you know, as Christian, Christians. But it's what happens on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday that matters. So we begin to show them our chest until we begin to be vulnerable with our youth and our young people so that they can identify that, hey, guess what? We've experienced the same struggles. And guess what? Some of us are still struggling with some issues. Until we can create that normalcy and come off of that super high spiritual horse of, I can do no wrong, they will never know the non-judgmental, caring, loving Jesus that's grounded in us. And that's important. That's important. Well, I think the church needs to deal with the issues of the day and the issues that impact people. And so I, I don't think there's anything uh, that people are dealing with that the church should shy away from. But the church should be a place where people can come, not just for the answers to their problems, but to be able to talk through the challenges of their lives. Um, and so teenage and unplanned pregnancies is, is definitely an issue that impacts our communities. The role of the church should be to keep an open mind, keep an open mind because this really does happen and you shouldn't um, uh, push the children away, the young people away that this happens to. You need to, you need to deal with the, um, the beginning, what, what, what's, what, what's going on, what's leading this child into this. So then if young ladies make a mistake, young men make a mistake, it's not a death sentence, it's not the end of life and the church that's supposed to be the family of God and embrace you and love you and lift you is there to help you to redirect, to find ways and means to make better choices or different choices and to enjoy the abundance that God has for us. Yet sometimes when they come in the church, we can be the most, we can be so hard on folks. If they make choices, they do things that alter their lives that doesn't reflect this persona that we try to have in the church, this persona of perfection this persona of sinlessness. And that's, it's counter to what the church is supposed to represent. You can come however you are with whatever choices you made in life and be received as part of the community, the body of Christ, the faith, the, the family of faith. Stop being afraid or ashamed or whatever it is about dealing with the realities of human beings being sexual beings. Have that conversation and create safe ground in the life of the church. Well, I think human sexuality is, is something, first of all, it's, it's interesting to note that, that the Bible doesn't shirk away from the topic of human sexuality. In fact, there are, there are whole books in the Bible uh, that, that really speak to, to that issue, uh, Song of Solomon and, and many places in other books as well. So I think having a, a, a realization that addressing human sexuality is, is is real. He said we're all sinners but we're saved by grace and we have to appropriate that grace to our lives on a daily basis. That's why the Bible says his mercy are new every morning because he knows we spend it every single day of our lives. And so the Bible is very clear on the fornication, on sin, on abstinence, on our body being the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's very clear but it's also very clear on the road to redemption. I think one of the things we can learn from Jesus is that every life is important. Every life is valuable. Um, every life is significant. And community has got to come around the mother and the father and the child um, to make sure that even in the midst of an unplanned pregnancy, um, that there's significance and love.
I used to be the youth minister at Abyssinian Baptist Church. And Dr. Butts, my pastor, and I were walking through the church one day and a young person came to me and said, yo, Ferg, what's up, man? Da -da 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 -da. And so Dr. Butts looked at me with a raised eyebrow and he said, Ferg? And I said, that's what they call me. He said, shouldn't they call you Reverend Ferguson? And I said, Doc, they will tell Ferg that they're having sex. They'll tell Ferg that they smoke weed. They'll tell Ferg that they did something wrong. They'll tell Ferg that they failed the class. They won't tell Reverend Ferguson that. So the trade-off for me was to, to trade the formality and the, and the desire to be called by a title for the realness, for the, the being a trusted resource, for being somebody that they could relate to, even as somebody who is much older than them. And I still do that and employ that today. Uh, in my work here at the college, uh, at, at LaGuardia Community College, in my work at, at the church, um, I always tell young people, be yourself. I would recommend that we start from the pulpit. Don't start from a private Bible study and a, you know, a private get together and a private workshop. Start from the pulpit. Talk about issues. Talk about your issues. Have examples of those that have gone through it to come up and to begin to share their story and to talk about how amazing God's love was and is for them to walk through it. Talk about it. Do something about it. And then after you've done that, Create circles of teens, which I call them restorative justice circles. And that's where the teens come together and they're able to talk in a very non-judgmental format. Um, we also have regular um, youth pieces, we call it Real Talk, in which our young people sit in groups with youth leaders and are able to have conversations around a range of things. So not just around sex um, ed stuff, but just around a range of issues that young people deal with. We also deal with our youth leaders and, and how we're gonna support the young man or the young woman in the midst of it right here at the church. Letting them know that their church is not gonna let go of them during this moment, but their church really is gonna grab a hold of them um, and give them even more support during this type of a moment and will be there for them, um, not just in the midst of this moment, for the duration. So it's the church's responsibility is to have um, uh, seminars, invite people in, people that, uh, that have an expertise in this. L let it be open, let it be an open subject. You can't say everything you need to say in a sermon. So that's really the responsibility of the church to have ideas outside of the every Sunday message. Because most people, their attention span is very short and they only get a few minutes of what you preach. So if you meet them right where they are, right where they are as far as uh, the young people having sex outside of marriage and you know, then the teen pregnancies and the unplanned pregnancies, all of this, needs to be addressed, but you have to know how to address it. That embraces people in spite of errors as God embraces us in spite of errors. And to encourage people to know that, that your error does not nullify your opportunity to have the abundance that God has promised to you. We've been very intentional in the church of, of attempting to have all of our men to adopt boys in our church. And by and large, to get our young guys uh, to, to embrace a grandfather in the church. There's something about that pouring of wisdom from generation to generation. As I think about what First Ladies in particular and churches in general can do to impact the lives of young people as they're navigating this really complex world of relationships and sexuality, I think the best thing we can do is to be is to love them, love on folks, love on these young people, and let them know it's just okay. It's hard, and it's sometimes, and sometimes it's easy, but it's, I think when our kids come to church, they just want somebody to love them and to care about them, and out of that love and care emerges conversations, things that are important to them. When people understand that you genuinely care about 